the House Armed Services Committee will come to order. We meet this morning to receive testimony on the future of national defense in the U.S. military 10 years after 9-11. Perspectives from former service chiefs and vice chiefs. This hearing is the third in our series of hearings to evaluate lessons learned since 9-11 and to apply those lessons to decisions we will soon be making about the future of our force. In the past month, we've heard from former chairman and, and a vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and also a panel of outside defense experts. Today, we'll hear from a former chief of staff of the Air Force, a vice chief of staff of the Army, and a former chief of the National Guard Bureau. In these capacities, our witnesses were directly involved in the management, training, and equipment, equipping of our force. This panel's collective time of service to our nation is over 110 years. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Their knowledge of the decision-making process within the Department of Defense, as well as their cumulative years of service, will provide this committee with vital information as we look to the future of our force. While we continue to make progress in Iraq and Afghanistan, and with the killing of high-profile terrorists, including Osama bin Laden and, most recently, al-Qaeda leader Anwar al-Awlaki, al I remain concerned that our nation is slipping back into the false confidence of a September 10th mindset. Believing that we can maintain a solid defense that is driven by budget choices, not strategic ones, is a dangerous path for our national security. I'm not arguing that the military can be held exempt from physical belt tightening. Indeed, half a trillion dollars has been cut from the Defense Department already. The military has absorbed about half of the deficit reduction measures enacted to date. But these cuts have happened in advance of the development of a new strategy for national defense and without any changes to the military's roles and missions. Even more concerning is that if the Joint Select Committee does not succeed in developing and passing another deficit reduction plan, an additional half a trillion dollars could be cut from our military automatically. It also remains to be seen whether or not additional cuts may be proposed by the administration, even if the Super Committee is successful. News reports last week indicated that the President is proposing further cuts to defense, again, driven by math, not strategy. But all this talk about dollars doesn't translate well into actual impacts on the force and the risk to our nation. I hope our witnesses today can help us understand, based on the lessons of the last 10 years, and there are over 100 years of experience, what strategic choices we face in the current global security environment and how further cuts to the military could shape these choices. The U.S. military is the modern era's pillar of American strength and values. In these difficult times, in these difficult economic times, we recognize the struggle to bring fiscal discipline to our nation. But it's imperative that we focus our fiscal restraint on the driver of the debt instead of the protector of our prosperity. With that in mind, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Now let me turn to our ranking member, Member uh, Smith from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing, and the hearings that you've held to date to discuss the defense budget, our strategic posture, and, and where we go from here in very uncertain times. And I'm very pleased to have the witnesses we have before us today. I look forward to their testimony. I think they can add considerable insight as to what those best choices are. And I also agree with the Chairman that the proposed cuts in the defense budget are a big risk, particularly if we do not make uh, the cuts necessary to prevent sequestration. Um, if we do not make the other changes to the budget that could prevent that, you are looking at sizable reductions in our national security budget in the Department of Defense in ways that we are not ready for and have not anticipated. And I agree with the Chairman that that's something to be prevented. I did not support 
the debt ceiling agreement in large part because all of the cuts were lumped onto the non-entitlement portion of the budget. Not only is that a problem for defense, that's also a problem for other non-entitlement areas like education and infrastructure, homeland security things that are equally important to the security of this nation, as, as is the Department of Defense. So we, we definitely have reason to be concerned about the impact of those cuts in the Department of Defense. I will, however, say that I think resources are part of the equation. Uh, we frequently hear in this committee folks say we shouldn't consider money when we're talking about national security because it's just that important. Well, unfortunately, it's a fundamental fact of life that the resources that you have available to you are part of the equation in figuring out what you're going to be able to do. Uh, and we do have choices in terms of how this impacts our need for revenue, what our tax rates are going to be, how much we're going to have to cut from other programs. And I think we have to consider that when we're looking at what our national security strategy should be. But with that said, we need a strategic review of the Department of Defense. Much has changed in the last 10 years and much will change going forward as we begin uh, the drawdown in Afghanistan, complete the drawdown in Iraq, as asymmetric hybrid threats continue to emerge in unpredictable ways. It is very appropriate right now to do a major strategic review of where best to spend our money uh, in the Department of Defense. I know the administration is embarking upon such a strategic review. This committee obviously is doing that. We need to make some hard choices and look at why we spend the money we spend in the Department of Defense. You know, why do we insist on a 313 ship Navy? Why do we have the force structure that we have? What do we ask them to do? And as importantly, if we're going to reduce any of that, what are we going to stop asking them to do? How are we going to make those changes and make sure that those two things match up? But I just want to close by emphasizing one of the points I made earlier, and that is that the rest of the budget matters in this discussion. And I know what this committee would like to do is to focus on the Department of Defense and national security and simply say that, look, these cuts are unacceptable for this reason. And as far as where you get the money, well, that's somebody else's problem. But here's why it is absolutely critical to our national security that we not cut below this level. But I think we do so at our own peril we have to consider the rest of the budget. If we as a committee are going to present a plan that says the defense budget has to be at this level, then it better fit within a realistic budget. We better be prepared to talk about where we're going to get the revenue to fund that, or if we don't want to get the revenue to fund that, how much are we going to cut the other programs? Because if those other cuts or that other revenue is not politically feasible, then you know, we can scream as loud as we want about the cuts to defense that are going to happen. So we have to talk about revenue. We have to talk about where we're going to cut other programs in order to afford the defense that this committee decides that we want. So I hope we'll have that broad discussion as well. And again, I thank the chairman for having this hearing, and I look forward to uh, the testimony from our very esteemed witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, happy to welcome our witnesses here today. We have General John Jumper former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Richard Cody, former Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General H. Stephen Blum, former Chief of the National Guard. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. We look forward to your testimony. Let's begin with General Jumper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to return to these rooms after uh, uh, so many years of absence and to see uh, so many familiar faces. Uh, and to be, appear uh, with my colleagues here, uh, we, we've sh shared uh, many very interesting hours uh, before this committee in, in the past together. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, members of the committee, both uh, actually collectively and individually, for all that you have done uh, for uh, the, uh, the soldiers and Marines in particular, but, uh, but all service members uh, on post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injuries. Uh, the process that, uh, processes that you have supported and enacted have helped us diagnose and treat this uh, uh, very uh, uh, disastrous disorder that uh, our, our people return from combat, and, uh, and it's very difficult to diagnose. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the committee, and the individuals who have uh, supported uh, those efforts. Sir, I've uh, submitted my, uh, my statement for the record, and I'll just uh, highlight a few points and take very little time uh, in doing. Uh, I think uh, there are several very important things to, uh, to remember, sir. Um, one is that uh, as we look forward to the future and trying to predict the world that we are going to be in, we've got to admit right up front that we are lousy predictors. Uh, if we look back uh, prior to the fall of the wall in 1988 and you look at the newspapers back in that time, uh, we read 
uh, how uh, the U.S. economy will be uh, uh, number two to Japan by the, by the turn of the century. We read uh, uh, the, all these papers, and you can hardly find the names Saddam Hussein, Slobodan Milosevic, Osama bin Laden. Uh, these are the very names that went on to uh, shape U.S. policy and U.S. military actions uh, for low the next 20 years. Uh, we are not good at predicting. And what that means to uh, people uh, like the people at this table who uh, wake up, st uh, stay up at night uh, worrying about things, the things we worry about are the things that we don't know and what comes next. And as we look forward to the uh, general uh, instability in the world, uh, we have to have a broad range of uh, responses available. It's not just about counterinsurgency or not just about uh, nuclear deterrence. It's not just about a conventional response to traditional threats. It's about all of these things. And the other things that we have learned over time is that the things that we get drawn into are not things that uh, uh, we would have uh, anticipated in any way uh, or uh, even a thought that we might find ourselves involved with. Uh, you can go back to 1994 and the Rwanda situation. As you look back on that, we did not get involved, but if you look back on that, we probably could have sent a rifle company into Rwanda during that crisis and saved 250,000 lives. We chose not to do it at the time. We did choose to get involved in other things. Kosovo, as a result of, uh, uh, of a genocide that was going on at the time and uh, in our participation, uh, participation in the last uh, year or so in the Arab Spring uh, movements around the world. Uh, it's not for the military people to decide what we're going to get involved with, but we do have to answer the phone when the phone rings. And you get that question, what have you got for me? And when you answer that question, you have to have a broad range of responses and capabilities able to answer the nation's needs. All the while, I think it's imperative that we keep our eye, Mr. Chairman, on our deterrent capability. And as we draw down and we look at cuts, the things that come under pressure are the things that uh, in many times are the most dangerous. We have to, this committee has to help the military leadership keep focus on the safety, the security, the reliability of our nuclear weapons as we draw down and we maintain this nuclear deterrent as part of our strategy. As far as roles and missions go, there's a lot that military can do to reduce the overlap in its capabilities. I've always been a proponent of uh, a written concept of operations. The system that, that we uh, use right now, we go out and we start buying things before we even are able to articulate how we're going to fight. We buy the things to fight with. I've always thought that a written concept of operations, joint concept of operations, that steered our way in areas of redundancy and overlap would reduce a lot of that redundancy and overlap that, uh, that we see. Also, as, uh, as budgets draw down, Mr. Chairman, it puts great pressure, internal pressure, on the services. And it brings out the very worst of us with regard to internal uh, strife, uh, especially, I might say, and Steve will acknowledge this, I'm sure, between the active duty, the uh, National Guard, and the reserves uh, over resources. We uh, have seen in the last 10 years the vital part that the, act, that the National Guard and the reserves have played uh, in the rotational basis, we've uh, gone back and forth uh, with, uh, with our units uh, in fighting the war on terror. Uh, that support has been unprecedented. Uh, it, uh, the, the, the committee is going to have to, again, give focus, to su focus support to making sure that as we draw down, we achieve that right balance, that right and correct balance between active duty, National Guard, and Reserve. And, of course, the other things that come under pressure as we look at further cuts, the first thing that goes is, uh, is uh, training, research and development. Uh, I have always said that uh, while the enemy may enjoy some asymmetrical advantages, low-tech asymmetrical advantages, the uh, asymmetrical advantage of this nation is its technology. And I hearken back to the uh, young airmen on horses in the early days of Afghanistan uh, uh, digitally relaying uh, coordinates up to B-52s that were dropping uh, GPS-guided munitions. It was the B-52 that was designed in the 1950s, the airman riding the horse that uh, the cavalry gave up, I believe, in 1932, the uh, uh, GPS kit that was strapped onto a bomb that, uh, that uh, came from World War II. It was the innovation and the technology that allowed us to turn the things that we had into, into things that we needed at that moment at the time. 
We do not want to give up the ingenuity of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that reinvent things every day that work on the battlefield. It's that technology, uh, that research and development is usually the first that's hit when you get into a budget squeeze. And finally, I'm going to say that uh, I'd like to say that uh, there are low hanging, there is low hanging fruits out there where we can realize savings uh, as a military. There's a lot in logistics. If we just unleash the power of best business practices and competition, uh, we could find tremendous savings in the logistics era, area. Once again, the service chiefs understand and they know this, uh, but it's going to take the help of this committee and this Congress, sir, to be able to uh, support our, uh, our military leadership as they seek these uh, ways to save and to minimize the drawdowns. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. Uh, General Cody. Good morning, Chairman, and thanks for having us. Um, I'll be brief. On uh, 8 April 2008, I testified before this committee as the Vice Chief of the Army. Then I was honored to represent our nation's 1 million plus soldiers, nearly 600,000 of them who uh, were serving on active duty, active guard and reserve on active duty, and over 250,000 of whom were deployed worldwide, most on 15-month combat tours, as I testified on issues critical to current and long-term readiness of the force. Today, again, I'm honored to testify before you as a private citizen, a retired soldier, but one who continues to do what I can to support our great soldiers, Marines, sailors, and airmen. Many things have changed since I testified in April 2008. The surge in Iraq has ended, and the Army is on course to withdraw some 45,000 soldiers by the end of the year. We have surged more soldiers uh, and Marines and airmen uh, into Afghanistan. The end strength growth of uh, 65,000 additional soldiers that we started in 2004 is complete. So now there's movement to reduce the Army's active duty uh, end strength as well as the Marines by significant numbers. The Army has completed the restructuring of the force and just finished the largest BRAC, MILCON, and global repositioning of our Army since World War II, all while fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, our economy is in a crisis mode. But probably most importantly, we've now been at war for over 10 years, and our ground forces and their families are worn thin. That said, many things have not changed. In 2008, I reported to you that the world we live in is exceedingly dangerous. Recent events in Southwest Asia, the Pacific, and the Arab Spring only highlight this fact in spite of the courageous efforts of our servicemen and women worldwide. I also reported to you that our Army was out of balance, that repeated tours of 12 months in combat with only 13 months back before deploying again was putting tremendous stress on the all-volunteer Army and their families. Today, that stress is still there as the Army continues to deploy soldiers on 12-month combat tours with less than 24 months back between tours. I testified then that we are consuming our strategic readiness, people and equipment with repeated tours in the harshest environments we've ever fought in, and most importantly, that our ability to man, equip, and train for full-spectrum operations somewhere else in the world while fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan was not possible. In 2008, I reported the cumulative impact of six years of continuing resolutions was causing significant problems within the services' ability to run their programs, prepare our men and women for the next rotation, and to reset equipment, equipment that has been in combat for over six years then, now much longer. Today, we enter another fiscal year with a CR while at war. It is one thing to deal with the uncertainty of our enemies and what new threats in the world we have to prepare for but is entirely another to deal with the uncertainty of year-to-year -year budgets and what resources will be available to sustain, to sustain today's fight and reset a force that has been at war for over 10 years for the next fight. As Congress and the Pentagon and the Executive Branch wrestle with the budget reduction required by the Budget Control Act, the real question in regard to the services and DOD's budget is simple. What missions do you want our military to continue to perform? What threats do you want our military to counter? What levels of readiness do you want the military to sustain? As General Jumper has said, history has taught us that we have not been very good at predicting where, when, and against whom the U.S. military will have to fight to protect the national interest and the security of this nation and its 315 million citizens. Simply put, when we size, scope, and resource our military for the peaceful and U.S.-friendly world we all hope for, and not for the dangerous, hostile, and unpredictable world that we actually live in, it is the American servicemen and women and our nation that we put at risk. During my six years in the Pentagon as uh, the Army's G3 and as Vice Chief, 
This Congress has always responded to the critical needs of our force, especially during the early years of Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. It is well documented we ended this global war on terrorism woefully short of equipment resulting from the defense budget cuts in the late 90s after the first Gulf War, especially for our Guard and Reserve Forces, and Congress responded. In my mind, further cuts in the DOD budget beyond what uh, Secretary Bob Gates outlined with his $400 million uh, is putting our military and our country at high risk. That spirit of support by Congress is still needed today for our troops. Thank you, sir. Thank you. General Blum. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. First of all, genuinely thank you for the opportunity to hear, appear this morning and, uh, and hopefully dialogue with the members of this committee on such an important subject, and that is the Armed Forces General, is, is your mic on? Push to talk, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, for 42 years I served in uniform, and during that entire time, this committee and the members of this committee and your predecessors that served before you have always been able to provide outstanding nonpartisan support for our men and women in uniform to ensure that we had the resources, we had the policies, and we were asking the tough questions that often, frankly, need to be asked in a building that gets very complacent with itself and its procedures. And I'm speaking about the Pentagon. So you have been very, very strong partners, and the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardmen of their nation have benefited for at least my time in service from your service to the nation. So I appreciate you having these hearings and giving us the opportunity to appear this morning before you. I will shorten my remarks. I've given you a set of prepared remarks for the record, but first I'll shorten my remarks by saying amen to what General Jumper said. Every single word that he said, I agree with. And General Cody, every single word that he said, I support and agree with so far. Now, we have not always agreed. The gentlemen at this table have not always agreed. We've had some tough, tough dialogue getting the United States Armed Forces, particularly the Air Force and the Army elements that I had responsibility to, to provide the state's National Guard forces as a Federal Reserve of those two uh, great services. We did not always see eye to eye to how we did it. But we do agree this morning on two very critical points. One, our nation and our Constitution is worth defending. And two, freedom is not free. And you can't get it readiness at a discount rate. You get what you pay for. How today we face a security environment around the world that this retired soldier feels may be the most complex and dangerous that we've ever faced in our nation's history. Predictability is not there. The international security landscape shifts every day, and every member in this room and those in the gallery have been surprised by world events almost daily. So as a result, our nation now requires more of its armed forces than at any other time in the nation's history. What a soldier has to do today, the tasks, the skills that they must possess are entirely different than those that George Washington needed at Valley Forge, that Ulysses S. Grant needed at Gettysburg, that John Pershing needed, that Douglas MacArthur needed, or Pete Schoomaker or Dick Cody needed from their army in Iraq and Afghanistan and the other 40 nations of the world where we are out engaged today in very, very dangerous and difficult operations. To state the obvious, as Mr. Smith said, this challenge does not just lie in the military. It resides in every sector of our society. As a nation, we really do have to find a way to do more 
efficiently with less. There's no question about it. But to do that job right, I maintain that the national security strategy of this nation has to be independently developed without any fiscal constraints. Once you set the strategy, then and only then can you make meaningful decisions based on an informed dialogue, based on managing and measuring risk. And then and only then can we determine how to best accomplish that strategy within the existing resources that the nation can provide. Certainly none of us at this table think that we're going to be able to resource everything and anything that we need, and we understand that there will be some risk we're going to have to assume. But when we assume that risk, it should be done in something in a different uh, thought process than st strictly a numbers drill. After some very, very difficult rebalancing, reorganization, and spending an enormous amounts of the United States taxpayers' treasury to catch up, we now have the most professional and capable total force in the United States military that this nation has ever fielded or the world has ever seen. It's unquestioned. Ladies and gentlemen, we must maintain this peerless military. It is really the lens through which most of the world views our nation. And if they see us as strong, they view us much different than if they view us as weak. And I've just come back from some international travel, and the way we're viewed overseas today is not the way we were viewed overseas five years ago. And if you ask them how they view us five years from now, it's even more disappointing. We cannot and must not allow that to happen. We must avoid repeating the past mistakes when simply numbers drills and, frankly, parochial interests of the services, of the departments, and of parties and politics enter into an equation on national security rather than geopolitical realities. We must drive the decisions so that we are prepared for the next unpredicted, unexpected threat against our freedom and our way of life. As this committee deliberates the tough choices that our nation faces, I ask you to consider a new paradigm that's being embraced by probably most, if not all, of the internationally successful profit-driven companies in the world. These companies have adopted a new paradigm. They size their full-time professional staff, whether it's manufacturing or sales or scientific development, they size that full-time professional staff for the smallest, lowest, steady-state business requirement of their business. But they size their part-time force, the trained and ready professionals that are ready on call, for their most optimistic demand or surge capability, market-driven. Why do they do this? They do this because they don't have unlimited resources, and they want to they want to husband what they do have and save that and at least keep part of it so that they can have research and development, they can have capital improvement, they can talk about modernization and recapitalization and expansion in the business community. What they want to avoid is mortgaging the ability to have that agile flexibility or to be able to take advantage of an opportunity in the market because they have their costs sunk into personnel costs, entitlements, benefits, retirement, health care, although we all at this table agree that those things are important, there is going to have to be some balance. If you see that model as successful, this soldier, this citizen soldier, thinks that that model may be informative to this committee, and you should seriously consider this when alternatives come out for how we're really going to balance the capability we need to have and the force 
structure and the size of the force we need to have <clears throat> and how we have traditionally salami sliced the forces to get to the acrimony that General Jumper was talking about because the fair share is not always fair and it's not even always smart. I would suggest you take a look at this model because it does give you a new paradigm to examine how we do these kind of things in a constrained environment, and I think it's quite useful. I think the strategy ar argues clearly for an increase, increased reliance on the Guard and Reserve as part of the total force. For the last 10 years, not only have our men and women in all services performed in a magnificent manner, it is noteworthy that the Guard and Reserve, after the extraordinary measures taken by the gentleman at this table, among others, and the committee that I'm speaking before today, we brought the Guard and Reserves from a 1947 structure on September the 11th, 2001, into the 21st century to right now they are standing shoulder to shoulder with the airmen and the soldiers of the United States Army and, and the United States Air Force, and I would challenge anybody in this room to distinguish a guardsman, a reservist, or an active duty member of the military unless you interrogated them or asked them specifically where they had come from, what they were doing before you saw them in theater or you saw them performing their work. I don't think you want to take a giant step backwards just because of a budget drill and have today's operational reserve be forced or relegated into only a Cold War relic strategic reserve role once again. And anything I w might remind you, anything you do to, to, to decrement or to lessen the capability of the, of the National Guard and Reserves, you are basically uh, passing a burden down to the governors of this nation and making their constitutional uh, responsibilities and authorities even more difficult to protect the, the citizens in every zip code that you actually represent here in Congress. If you want to read a little bit more, I would commend General Craig McKinley's uh, recent white paper published March 31st, 2011, A Great Value Today and in the Future. I would commend that to you. Uh, last fact before I close, when you call out the Guard and Reserve, you do in fact call out America. When you're considering value, the value of that, ladies and gentlemen, is priceless. Thank you for what you do for our nation. Thank you for holding these hearings on this most serious and urgent matter. And uh, I anxiously would be welcoming any questions that you might have. And thanks for the opportunity to contribute in this dialogue on this very serious issue. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, let's consider the impact of funding cuts on end strength. We know from what we've seen so far with the $465 billion in the first tranche, there's going to be a significant uh, cut in end strength. But in the event of sequestration or a 10 percent reduction to the fiscal year uh, 2013 budget request, military spending would be reduced by about $55 billion a year starting next October. If the Department chooses to shed end strength to meet just part of this goal, we could easily be back below pre-9-11 levels for the Army and Marine Corps. Based on your experience, what would the consequences be to the force and the military readiness by reducing the Army and Marine Corps end strength to or below pre-9-11 levels by fiscal year 2013? And what are the consequences for reducing the size of the Air Force, which is already smaller than the force we had on 9-11? And one last thing that I have is one of the things that uh, that we talked quite a bit about the last few years, but the last few months we haven't been talking about is the reset as we pull our troops out of Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, where are we going to get the money to reset? How much is that going to take? And what effect is that going to have on the force? The 
chief told me I could take it first. Uh, I spent six years in the Pentagon, Mr. Chairman, uh, working on force structure. Uh, the first time I testified before this committee was 1998, after Task Force Hawk. Uh, I stated then for the record that I thought we were a 10-division Army with a 14-division mission. Uh, got criticized quite a bit. <laughs> Interesting to note that in the QDR of 2000, uh, before 9-11, as you say, September 10th, there was movement afoot uh, by the accountants and uh, budgeteers to cut that force from 10 divisions down to 8. That stopped when 9-11 happened. We entered uh, this global war on terrorism uh, with a force of 482,000, uh, a little over 500,000 National Guard, and I think about 200 some odd thousand uh, Army Reservists. Uh, our readiness levels of those units, uh, the combat support and combat service supports from the cuts of the 1994 uh, through 98 had uh, left those portions of the units untrained. Our first to deploy units like the 101st, the 82nd, the 1st Cav Division uh, were fine, 3rd uh, Armored Cav Regiment, but quite frankly we didn't have the depth. What I've learned in six years of doing this was when you take a look at the 1421 that's in uh, this committee's uh, uh, think uh, piece of one, uh, you know, uh, how we force structure. When you put in all these different strategies and then you force size it, if you don't put that strategy into motion and put, put a temporal nature to it, you run out of troops very quickly. Let me explain. Uh, we had uh, four sizing constructs that got us to 482,000 that said uh, we'd be fighting one decisive with the ability to swing to another decisive and we could be in four lesser contingencies. That's fine. And so they, they four sized to that. The problem was we got into this war and we were there 2003, 2004, 2005. If you remember in 2004, we were so short forces, we had to turn to the National Guard and activate, mobilize nine National Guard brigades that were not equipped, which meant we had to dip into our strategic reserve equipment through the world. Uh, we have underpredicted every year, and it put tremendous stress on the active duty force and on the National Guard because of people using these force sizing constructs and not putting it in motion. And today, we're a tired Army. Today, we're a tired Marine Corps. Today, the National Guard uh, is tired. But we have built them up. Uh, I think cuts below uh, 540,000 in the active duty force uh, puts that at risk again, because we don't know where we're going to be five years from now. We're in a 10-year war today. Uh, it's longer than Vietnam. I think yesterday was the uh, high water mark. Uh, that's the war we think we're in. Our enemies are in a hundred-year war. And so we get be very, very careful of these four-sizing constructs. Uh, I believe you need to four-size for mid to worst case, because quite frankly, that's what we've been executing for the last 10 years. I testified before this committee that we predicted in 2004 and 5 that we'd be down to six brigades in Iraq. In execution, in year four, uh, 5 and 6, we we're at 19 to 21 brigades. Yet we force structured uh, the budget for going down to six to eight brigades. And how did we make it up? You all had to pass omnibuses and supplementals. And they were late to the fight. That is the danger when you start bringing this force down. The other thing I'll just say, and then I'll turn it over to uh, General Jumper and General Blum. When we started the all-volunteer force in 1973, America's demographics were different. And the military kept track of men at the time because uh, that's the way we tracked it, 17 to 24-year-olds. When we started the all-volunteer force back then, over 90 percent, almost 90 percent of that demographics, 17 to 24-year-old males, met the minimum mental, physical, and moral standards to be in the military. When we started really growing the Army and growing the Marine Corps uh, in 2006, 35 percent of that population in the U.S. today meets the minimum standards. That is a real problem. And so if we cut again and break trust with this force that stayed with us for 10 years, and then 
we run into something else, as we've talked about, we, we don't get to pick and choose. I don't know if we can grow that force back again. So it's a big problem for us. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, General Cody's uh, words are, uh, are right on the mark. Um, from an Air Force point of view, uh, we see, uh, I think, the, uh, as you have said earlier, the necessity to accommodate uh, company any reduction in forces with a strategy that can be understandable and enforceable by the military services. Uh, if, we, uh, if, we, if we make uh, cuts uh, through uh, uh, the lens of the budget, uh, then we have uh, in the past always done ourselves uh, an injustice and found ourselves uh, really unprepared for uh, what has happened next. Uh, and we stand a greater danger of doing that now than we, we ever have before. Uh, the tempo of the equipment in the Air Force is much like that of the, uh, of the Army and the Navy. We've uh, uh, run our, uh, especially our airlift and our tactical systems, very hard. Um, when this, uh, uh, when this uh, conflict first started off, as we prepared to go into Iraq in 2003, we had 10 Air Expeditionary Force packages assembled and ready to go. They were on a rotational basis. We essentially pulled all of those forward to meet the initial requirements uh, to get into a theater and, se and set ourselves up and had to reset our whole rotation base because we used uh, elements of, of all 10 of those force packages. Uh, if we get into the situation where uh, uh, budgets uh, also uh, dictate our, our relationship with our allies. It's something else we have to do from a strategy point of view. Indeed, I do believe that uh, it's time to reconsider our relationship with some of our allies and our participation in some of our alliances, and uh, those uh, could well be restructured. But uh, to lose contact uh, with long-standing allies or abandon uh, the uh, the common cause that we have established over years uh, of time, I think, would be extremely dangerous uh, and would jeopardize our nation's ability to be a strategic force st for stability uh, in the entire uh, world, which, uh, uh, which I think we are. And then when it comes to reset, of course, the Air Force's problem is uh, not nearly as difficult as the Army and the Marines, but again, we have uh, equipment that has been used day in and day out, deployed, uh, redeployed, uh, with uh, scant time to uh, catch up with the proper uh, maintenance and overhauls that, uh, that are required. Uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we get everything back, uh, a lot of this equipment is going to be, uh, uh, is going to require, uh, again, expensive uh, upgrades and overhauls. Uh, I would reiterate that I think there's uh, a lot of money to be saved here by uh, looking at some commercial best, best practices to see how we might go about this, but indeed, uh, it, it just to, just to uh, reset the uh, uh, the forces that we have and the equipment that we have is going to be uh, uh, require the support uh, of, of this committee, and uh, uh, so I think that uh, again as we draw down, it's going to be uh, have to be with a strategic goal in mind. It's going to have to be with uh, the idea that our relationships around the world uh, will be modified, uh, will of, of necessity and we very quickly get to dangerous levels that will uh, keep us uh, out of critical parts of the world scene that we've uh, always been a part of. Thank you, sir. I, I didn't answer, Mr. Chairman, uh, the equipment reset. I had a brain cramp. Uh, in 2006 and 2007, uh, we had ramped our depots. Uh, I'll speak for the Army depots, the five Army depots, but certainly uh, Yermo and, uh, and Georgia depots and the Marines got ramped up also. We moved from 5 million direct labor hours uh, when the war started to 27 million direct labor hours. Our depots actually bailed us out of our readiness problems as we grew. Uh, and they did unbelievable work. And they teamed with uh, commercial. And we actually mobilized uh, the depots with the uh, with, uh, commercial industry to reset our equipment. We said then in 2006 and 2007 that we'd have to spend about $17 billion a year to reset this equipment that's been in the worst environments we've ever had, highest op tempo, uh, basically tanks, Bradleys, Apache helicopters, you, you pick them, night vision goggles, weapon systems, where we're putting 15 years of life on them in one year. That equipment all stayed over in Iraq and Afghanistan because we had to rotate on equipment. So it hasn't come out. It's now coming out. Uh, back in 2008, we had five brigades worth of equipment sitting in our depots to be repaired. Uh, I don't know what the number is today, but when I look at the depot 
uh, and the reset accounts and the O&M dollars of the military's budget, it is woefully short. And there is a big bow wave and a bill to be paid uh, on this equipment when it comes back. And it will be a readiness issue that a future chief will be in here next year or the year after saying, okay, you cut our procurement dollars, we brought the equipment back, and now we're C4 because of equipment. And I see that as a very big problem. Again, I find myself in a position of concurring totally with General Jumper and General Cody and their comments. I would only have one other thing to add. The unintended consequence is the signal that you send to our adversaries because they measure some of our actions as our resolve, our national resolve. And I've already told you uh, some of the impressions that I've picked up in some recent international travel, that there is a perception that our resolve may be waning. If that is the perception of our friends and our allies, what do you think the perception might be of our adversaries or our potential enemies? The other signal, again, is that you, you must understand that with the current strategy that we have, any reduction of the force, the total force, or any component of that force only increases the stress on the members of that force because we are not yet in any of the services at the dwell to deployment cycle that we would like to be. We are not, in other words, if we were heavyweight fighters, uh, we are not getting our time in the corner between rounds. Sometimes we're going out there and fighting two rounds before we even get any time in the corner. And that is taking a toll on the force, and that needs to be considered if we're going to sustain uh, the tremendous, magnificent military that we presently have. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, <clears throat> the question I want to ask is, where do you see where we could make savings within the current budget? Um, and if you look at what our current strategies are, our current missions, except for the moment that we're going to keep those, those missions, you know, with, with the anticipated changes in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, are there places we could save money and still maintain that, that mission capability? And then the second piece of the question would be, okay, if we can't, what missions should we decide not to do in order to find savings? Um, those two questions. Just to set the context, I set this a little bit in my opening statement, but didn't drive home the point on where our budget is at. I think the points you gentlemen make about the challenges to the Department of Defense budget and the missions we've asked um, our uniform military to perform is correct. Um, but there's also a big, huge budget challenge, and our budget is 40 percent out of whack. Uh, you know, we. The amount of money we raise is 40 percent less than the amount of money we spend. And if you accept for the moment that we need to balance that budget and that we're not going to bring in any new revenue and we can't touch defense, basically what you'd have to do is you'd have to cut everything else in the budget by roughly half. To be honest, the half is a slight exaggeration. It's probably 48 percent. That means Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, infrastructure, everything by almost 50 percent. Um, and I'm personally not even, I don't even begin to be prepared to do that. Uh, so, so those are the choices that we face as, as we put this forward. And I think we have to keep that in mind because every portion of that budget can give testimony along the lines of what you're talking about, about the devastating impact of those cuts and, and be somewhat accurate. So. We're in a bit of a pickle here, so I so I ask the question um, again within within our current mission set. Are there areas where you go? You know what? We could save money there. We could do this more efficiently and still meet that mission set. Um, or second question is, what missions are we currently funding for that we probably shouldn't be? Are there any two areas where you could find savings in well, in one of those two ways or both? Thank you. When you I mean, we, it is a dilemma. Um, but when you take a look at the, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years, uh, 
even with Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary Gates, uh, and now with Secretary Panetta, uh, the military has already cut some 240 programs uh, across the board uh, to shift the weight of the force. We were a big lethargic force, uh, better set for the Cold War, not set as well for asymmetrical and irregular warfare. And so we did it while we were fighting the war. We actually restructured the entire army, uh, the Air Force restructured. We restructured the National Guard into a better dual purpose force that could be operational. The problem was we did it, uh, Mr. Congressman, on the fact that we already were in a hole from 1994. I mean, uh, from 94 to 98, even to 99, uh, it was almost a procurement holiday. And so you had two things. You had a, a force that wasn't sized for the uh, threats that we see. If I may, John, I, I, I accept all that. And, you know, we are where we are. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, I mean, it seems to be what the three of you gentlemen are saying, is that there's no level of, of cuts. There's nothing in the current military that can be cut. Well, let me put it slightly different. Not that there's nothing in the current military can be cut. We can't spend less than we're currently contemplating. In fact, we should spend more. No. Um, is that is that accurate? I mean, it, it leads to implications, but that's no. where we got to start. No, no, there's, there's uh, cuts to be made. I mean, uh, before uh, even the Budget Control Act, Secretary uh, Gates and the uh, services already uh, ponied up uh, something like $400 billion. Uh, while we're fighting a war, while we have yeah. uh, 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, and while you had something like 80,000 troops at the time in Iraq and other commitments across the world, uh, he said, I can find $400 billion worth of efficiencies, uh, cut back on these programs. We only have one new Air Force airplane on the drawing board for the first time in years compared to uh, some of our competitors. So that was being done. Uh, to tie uh, the whole or half the weight of the budget control problems that this country has put itself in to a military who, by the way, has been trying to police itself up very uh, in my mind, uh, tough love down there in terms of budget cuts the years I was there while we were fighting a war. Uh, I think there are more places you can go, but I warn that if you're talking about significant cuts to end strength, if you're talking about significant cuts to resetting the force uh, and not, main Do you not maintaining the program, right. uh, I don't know where we're going to be uh, Understood. if Do you something have goes wrong. Do any of you have, you say there are more places, do you have specific Yeah, there, there are some more places, ideas? but uh, I don't see them as significant as the $400 billion that had already been put on the table. In fact, I'm a little nervous about the $400 billion. That's the gist I'm getting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, listen, this is tough. This is about choices as a nation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to pick. And uh, this is, as Steve Blum has said, and uh, we can go talk to historians, I think this world is more dangerous than any time in modern history. Do you think it's possible to meet those national security needs that you've, you've outlined without increasing the revenue that we have in the federal government? Um, I'm not an economist. Uh, I think at some point we're going to have to ask, how much is America sharing the burden? I mean, I know everybody's, you know, we've got unemployment problems. Uh, we've got all kinds of uh, problems, but quite frankly, uh, uh, when, you, when you talk to soldiers and uh, you talk to families, uh, they've been carrying this burden for 10 years, a heavy burden uh, financially as well as separations and everything else. And, you know, we have to wake up and realize this is a terribly unfriendly world for us right now and extremely dangerous. And so if we have to tax more, uh, I'm all for taxing everybody. Uh, you guys will have to figure out uh, what it is because I'm not an economist. Right. But uh, it's not going to get better. Putting our fiscal uh, house in order is important. But we need to be very, very careful about the choices and chances we take with the national security right now. Thank you. I, I yield back. Sir, may I add that... Uh uh, as Dick says, the services are, in the, are right now over, the, over there putting together plans to deal with this $400 billion or so cut, whatever it turns out to be. We've also given up in the last, uh, in the last 10 years $46 billion worth of research and development by, through cancel programs. Things that were scheduled to be uh, come in to recapitalize our forces 
uh, that have been canceled, major programs. Just the research and development and where we were in those programs when they were canceled added up to $46 billion. Um, having said that, I do believe there are places we should look. I think we should t take a serious look in, at our tactical nuclear uh, program, uh, our tac tactical nuclear forces as a, as a part of our uh, NATO alliance, and uh, how much of that we really need. Uh, as I said before, I think uh, uh, we could take a look at uh, how much uh, forward stationing uh, we really need as we uh, 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 relook at, uh, at the structure of our alliances around the world. Uh, and then um, I think, uh, uh, again, in the area of logistics, I think uh, within the spirit of the, of the uh, uh, air logistics centers and the depot 50 50 uh, sharing rule, uh, I think we could find ways to restructure to let uh, industry best practices in and save ourselves a tremendous amount of money as we look forward to, uh, to resetting. But as Dick points out, uh, when you look at, the, at this uh, in proportion to the, the problem we have, these are certainly uh, things we all should do. A lot of this is low-hanging fruit, but it takes a lot of courage, a lot of support from this committee as, as uniform military leadership sits, sits at this table and asks for your support to do tremendously unpopular things. Uh, they're going to need your support to do it in order to take advantage of even these, uh, these small actions that might be, uh, that, that might be uh, helpful uh, in, in, the, in reducing the, uh, the burden. Uh, Still in all, uh, you, the problem you point out, uh, Congressman Smith, is, is one that we've all got to be concerned with, and that is uh, uh, this uh, a tremendous burden that uh, has to be paid for uh, in, in some way. You're exactly right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. I first have a question uh, for uh, General Blum, for my colleague, uh, Frank uh, Lobianda, who can't be here. General Blum, could you please tell us, give us uh, your thoughts on how the Air Force could be better utilizing the Air National Guard's fighter fleet in terms of transferring missions and getting them newer iron while reaping the benefits of overall cost savings? If I can get this microphone to come on. Thank you for the question. And, and um, uh, Congressman Lobiondo's question uh, gets actually to the business model that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, the good news with the Guard and Reserves is that they are now competent, professional, and, and actually when they're on duty with their active duty counterparts, you're talking equality in performance and capability. Uh, some, some argue that they bring civilian acquired skills and that makes them in some mission sets even more valuable. I'm not making that argument right now, although I could. What I'm, what I'm saying, suggesting is for the routine missions, for instance, if you want to expand uh, the capability of the Air Force, airplanes cost what airplanes cost. It isn't any cheaper for a National Guard pilot to fly them than an than a, uh, Air Force pilot to fly them as far as what the fuel costs or what the operating hours cost or what the cost of the airplane is. Where you, ca where you gain your efficiencies there is you're only paying that pilot to fly the plane when he's flying the plane. He's, you're not paying him 365 days of the year when, or the days that he's not flying. And, and so you could maintain, you could make an argument, you could maintain three to four pilots in the Air National Guard uh, essentially available to fly that plane owned and operated by the United States Air Force on call for the cost of one pilot in the Air Force. And you could also make the argument that that pilot may end up being, tends to be a more experienced pilot because you, they serve longer and they retire later and so you basically get a longer shelf life from them. So what it does is it gives you a personnel model that, is, that does get to what Mr. Smith is talking about and how do you do more with less. In other words, okay, if I'm going to do this with all active duty Air Force, you're going to pay a dollar uh, for every, you know, you're going to pay full amount for that pilot to be on duty every single day and he isn't going to fly every day. But when you do it with the Guard or the Reserves, you're only paying that pilot for when he's actually in the cockpit and performing the mission, essentially. There are other times you pay him for training in administrative and medical exams and that kind of thing. But the cost is 
rough order of magnitude, uh, about three to four to one. In other words, you can get three or four Guard or Reserve people in the Air Force for what it costs for a full-time Air Force person. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need a full-time Air Force. You, I, I'll, even as the Chief of the Guard and Reserve, I was also, I mean, a Guard, I was also at U.S. Northern Command and a Joint Combatant Command, and, and there's, a, there's a very legitimate need for a standing Air Force and an active duty Air Force. And, and you know, uh, you, you're going to have to balance the risk versus the war, reward, uh, the, the benefits uh, against the disadvantages, and there are a few disadvantages, but if you're just looking at how do you basically expand the force without exponentially increasing the cost, then I'd say an increased reliance on the Guard and Reserve is something that this committee ought to really take a pretty serious look at because there are some efficiencies there. But I don't want to say, and I won't say, that you don't need a, a, an active duty Air Force of substantial size so that it can handle the steady state so that, so that you're not disrupting and interrupting citizen soldiers needlessly. But on the other hand, if, that, if, if, if their national strategy cannot be met by the natural, national resources, then you're going to have to look at different business models than we've looked at in the past. What General Jumper alludes to is what will probably happen, sir, is that if, if we get a, a man, not we because we're retired, but if the current people in, in the positions that we recently held uh, get a, a mandate, what likely will occur in the building is that there will be a fair sharing, with a quote unquote fair sharing, of cuts against the active force, the guard force, and the reserve force. And so what we will do is we'll cut a slice of the pie out of the Army, and that will cost full value because they're full-time people. And then you'll get, and let's say that value is X, and then you'll do the same pie slice or a different pie slice out of the Guard or Reserve, and that'll cost X minus because they don't cost the same, frankly. They cost less. So you'll actually get less, you'll harvest less by that slice than you will in the active duty slice. But what it will really start is the Yugoslavian uh, model of an army disintegrating into three different armies and fighting itself and an Air Force doing the same thing because all three of us have seen this ugly uh, <coughs> dynamic happen now through our whole adult careers. That should be avoided. It's, it doesn't serve the nation well, it doesn't serve the members of the armed forces well, and it doesn't serve the American citizens well. What, so to answer your, your, your colleague's question directly, uh, I will re repeat what I said. I, I think a careful examination of, of the, the risk versus reward and the value of having an expanded force and an increased reliance in the Guard and Reserves it doesn't, it doesn't allow you to get airplanes cheaper. It doesn't allow you to operate them cheaper. But it does cut down your personnel costs. And they are significant in, in, a, in, a, in a volunteer professional force. Sir, if I uh, might uh, jump onto these uh, comments, is that permitted? I, 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 we're, we're, we're over time. Let me, we'll get back to you. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, the service you're doing to the, for the uh, country and the Congress by having these hearings. Um, I think there's insufficient attention being paid to the fact that if the Special Select Committee does not come to an agreement, we are facing certain automatic cuts in the neighborhood of half a trillion dollars over a 10-year period to the defense budget. You can argue that that's a good idea or a bad idea but to not even take into account the arguments to whether it should happen or not, I think is very important. And the fact that you're having these hearings is focusing attention on that, and I thank you for that. And I, I thank the, the gentlemen on the panel for their incredible service to our country. I, I can't um, express enough how grateful we are for the, the lives you've given to your country and how well you serve. Um, I want to ask a question that's not a rhetorical question. Uh, I do want you to answer as well as you can. In the 10 years since 2001, if you take out the overseas contingency operations, put aside all the costs of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, in real dollar terms, the core defense budget is 40% higher than it was 
in 2001. Uh, our end strength is essentially the same as it was in 2001. Uh, our number of ships and airplanes is essentially what it was in 2001. A little, little different, but not much different. Now, about a fifth of that cost, that 40% increase, has gone to increase compensation for uniform personnel and civilian personnel. Um, where did the rest of the money go? What did we buy for that money? I, I can take that question, Congressman, because uh, a lot of it went to the Army uh, to equip our combat, combat support, and combat service support soldiers uh, for a 360-degree battlefield. That was in your procurement accounts. Uh, it was also to equip and bring up to uh, combat status the equipment in the National Guard and Reserves. Um, I can give you about I mean, I dealt with this every day for six years. Radios the Guard didn't have because they weren't secure. We didn't buy them, so we had to get them uh, upgraded. Uh, night vision goggles. They had the old night vision goggles, so we had to buy them. But we also had to buy them for everybody because there was no uh, line where you had rear echelon and you didn't have to worry about protected lines. Yeah. Everybody was in the battlefield. Uh, Jessica Lynch's convoy they got, uh, that got hit was a uh, telling moment for all of us that you know, combat service support troops need to be equipped as well as the combat troops. We have a moral obligation if we're going to put troops into harm's way that they're the best equipped, best led, and best trained. That generated gunnery. Mm -hmm. uh, before our combat soldiers fired gunnery three or four times a year, our combat service support people didn't. General, we I'm, had to bring everybody up to that. So. All the things you talk about, I think, have essentially unanimous su support on this committee because we understand the urgency of outfitting our troops properly. But, you know, some of it, the GAO said that $296 billion of that money went to cost overruns in 27 major weapon systems. Um, you know, R&D phase is exploding. Uh, just looking at data on the, uh, the, the uh, SIBRS program, the space-based infrared program, where the, uh, the, the per unit cost of that program's quintupled uh, since the program began, which you know, means we're going to spend five times as much money when we actually buy the copies of it in the end. What suggestions do you have as to ways that we can curb this voracious appetite for cost overruns in major weapon systems? Well, I think, uh, one, uh, as, as I look back on it, uh, first off, you're right, there have been some number curdy breaches and large cost overruns in uh, space programs, uh, big platforms, uh, and things of that sort. Uh, you know, quite frankly, the predictability of the budget each year uh, uh, causes problems not only for uh, the program managers that are running these things, but also for the, uh, the industry that's trying to predict what their costs are going to be. Uh, I can remember on the Joint Strike Fighter when they rescoped it uh, several times uh, as they rescoped that program, uh, the cost went up. Uh, I'm not an expert in that acquisition process for sure. I've been on the receiving yeah, the, end the, of it. The unit cost on that's gone up by al almost double uh, since that program started. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, what uh, Secretary uh, Carter is doing uh, in looking at these things uh, is the right thing to do. But I also want to go back to the fact that during these 10 years, we cut several programs and really lightened and refocused the force uh, in ways that, uh, quite frankly, if we hadn't been at war, we wouldn't have done. And we, and we restructured the force and we equipped the force with what's really needed. Uh, and so the fiscal overruns and the uh, anecdotes of this program or that program are interesting. But when you take it in the whole, uh, DOD has done a pretty good job in the last 10 years of policing up some of these things. Now, there are ones that stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, and I think you ought to deal with that uh, as you can. Uh, but we do have a moral obligation every day. If we're going to send men and women into combat, they better be the best led. They better be the best equipped. We don't want to go into a fight with parity. I, I see my time. So I, I would completely agree with you. I would also say we have a moral obligation to taxpayers to be sure that we're paying 
value for what. We absolutely need to equip the troops with what they need, but we have a moral obligation to taxpayers to be sure we're not paying three dollars for something we could buy for a dollar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your kind words uh, about holding this uh, hearing. But we both serve on the Education Committee. And if we, you look at the dollars that have been spent on education over the last 10 years, 20 years, and then, and then look at the return and how the education uh, scores and everything else have gone down, we, we've got problems not just at the DOD. We've got problems across the whole federal government spending that we all also really need to look at. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as I begin, I want to thank uh, Congressman Andrews for his um, a very heartfelt uh, statement about our chairman, uh, his bipartisanship, uh, how indeed this hearing is important, and the tradition of this committee truly has been uh, to support our military, uh, to defend our country, and uh, the, I see the primary function of the national government is national defense. Uh, also, uh, I'm uh, really grateful uh, to see General Blum and uh, General Cody here. I've had three sons uh, serve. Uh, in the National Guard, uh, one for a year in Iraq, and it was an extraordinarily uh, meaningful experience to him uh, to um, help the American people at home by defeating the terrorists overseas. And I'm also grateful, uh, General Jumper, that I have a nephew in the Air Force, so I'm covering you, uh, and, I, um, and I know of your leadership, but I also uh, we're joint service. Uh, my number two son's a doctor in the Navy who served in Iraq, so um, uh, again, thank you for what you do. And uh, indeed, as we're talking about the future of national defense, uh, for each one of you, beginning uh, with General Blum, because you in indicated uh, the dangerous environment, the no predictability, uh, I certainly agree with the statement that we're uh, in a hundred year war. Uh, the statement's been uh, that we have the watch, they have the time. That's what they think. Uh, I, I believe um, ultimately the American people do have resolved, but could you, each one of you, indicate what you see as the biggest threat um, to the United States and the American people today? I think the biggest, are you asking me to go first on oh, this? Yes, please. Absolutely, General. The biggest thing that I worry about, frankly, is complacency and being numbed it almost becomes a constant background noise because so few of U.S. citizens really are engaged in this conflict. Uh, it's the smallest percentage of any conflict we've ever had in the history of our country, when you think about it. Those that are defending our freedom or guaranteeing and ensuring our way of life and the fact that that you can do what we're doing in this building and what we do outside, that burden is being carried by a, an extraordinary low percentage of the American people. And frankly, the Guard and Reserve provide the connective tissue so that our armed forces, as magnificent as they are, as trained and professional and dedicated and patriotic as they are, don't become viewed by the American people as a foreign legion or a, a mercenary unit. They, that's, that's why I would do absolutely nothing to lessen the connectivity to the American people uh, through the Guard and Reserves, because business cases will cause you to consolidate active duty bases, make them more efficient. Where they are gets more and more away from the general population. What they do behind those gates is pretty much who cares to the general population unless they make their living off of what goes on in there. And the sons and daughters like mine and yours and those in the room that have members that are serving, um, I don't want them disassociated with the American people. And I think the best insurance policy for when making sure that the American people are in this fight, look, I'll give you examples. Uh, Dover Air Force Base in Delaware, if they deploy, no, nobody in Delaware really knows where they went or what they did or if they're gone. But if the Delaware Guard goes, the Delaware Air Guard goes, 
everybody in, in, Do in uh, Dover knows all about it, or everybody in Newcastle knows all about it. If, um, if you go to West Virginia, there, there is no active duty in West Virginia. So the only connectivity to our armed forces in West Virginia is the Guard and Reserves. And there are many states like that. So the footprint be to gain efficiencies that, are, that we all want, our Department of Defense to be efficient and cost effective, there are, there are downsized risks to that. A prof a, a, an all-volunteer force uh, means, uh, you know, okay, they're over there. But when, when you send a guard unit or a reserve unit, the whole community goes. Every, and they're there while they're there, and they support them while they're there. So that is one of the big reasons that, that I say the thing I'm most afraid about on a long war with the United States where, where everybody doesn't have somebody in this, very few of us do, is that we get complacent and it becomes... It, it, we get disconnected from the American people. That's my greatest fear, because if you keep the American people in this and you keep the national focus on what's going on, that, then I don't have anything, I don't think we have anything to fear. I think the enemy better be, be very fearful. But if the American people get disassociated from this, either because of fatigue or, or numbness to it, or because they don't have a personal stake in it, I think it's a terrible, terrible uh, danger. So that's why I say an increased reliance on the Guard and Reserve is not only economically smart, it, it is really a strategically uh, imperative. It's a strategic imperative if you're going to maintain a volunteer force, total force. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate as well having the hearings. I, I think one of the, the concerns I have is sometimes there isn't the opportunity for give and take uh, on a number of these issues, and so I would hope that in addition to the hearings, maybe there is some way that we can also have a greater role as we move into this process right now. And <clears throat> uh, thank you all very much uh, again for being here for your service. And, you know, a along with that, I. I you, you've been you've been around a long time. Um, you've been to these hearings for many many years. Uh, you've probably felt a number of frustrations as you see some of the decisions that are made, whether they are tactical or strategic. Could you share with us? Is there anything that you feel that would be helpful as we move forward and want to play a role in these discussions because we think it's so critical that it's not just a knee jerk decision that's made. Uh, regarding these cuts, and I'm not suggesting that they will be, but I think, you know, you, you know how important it is to, to really be thinking on the front and back end. You know, what's going on here? What are the unintended consequences, and how do we make sure that we do the right thing? Is there anything in your history of, of being so engaged at this level that you could share that would be helpful as we move forward? Well, thank you, ma'am, and, and I never you know, worried coming over here. Uh, I didn't enjoy it a lot, but it was, <laughs> I never worried about it because I knew at the end of the day uh, we needed to tell the story, we needed to uh, lay, lay our cards out on the table, and then uh, cooler heads would pre prevail. Uh, but we are at an inflection point in our history. Um, General Blum uh, talked about uh, the national will, basically, of, of this country. I do worry about that. But right now, uh, what we've learned in the last 10 years, or what I have learned, and uh, several of the former service chiefs and vices and leaders, uh, is this. The all-volunteer force is absolutely uh, the best thing this country has done in the military. Uh, it is absolutely precious. And the fact that we've got young men and women who, last year and the year before, after watching this war, raised their right hand and said, you know what? I'm going to go serve. This is important. I worry about losing the all-volunteer force as we get into these fights about budgets and about entitlements versus defense and things like that. I can't remember a force, and I've been in a long, long time from the Vietnam War now. I can't remember a more professional, patriotic, and dedicated force as well as their families. And so I'd put that as job one. We've got to retain this all-volunteer force. Can I ask you, General, do you believe that the discussions around um, military retirement 
um, could impact those Absolutely. decisions of a volunteer force? And do you have any thoughts about what the the committee is doing? The business, the defense business board is recommended, as you know, going to 401ks. Um, could you weigh in on that? We don't know how to do 401ks. We don't know how to do uh, any type of that management. We live checkbook to checkbook. I've seen the figures on it. I'm very, be very, very careful with this retirement program. I've seen numbers are saying <laughs> only 13 percent of the people actually benefit from it. Yeah, those are the people that lead. Those are the people we invested in. And so some, you know, we size an army, we size an air force. It's a young men and women's game. People come in and serve, and then they go out and become great citizens. As, as we look at some of the, if it, I'm sorry, just because yeah. my time, as, as we look at some of these personnel issues that are coming up then, and I don't know if any of you uh, generals would like to comment, uh, are there areas in the personnel that we should be looking at that would um, help us be more sustainable, as people have suggested, of course, that it's not sustainable anymore? I think uh, your, your, uh, your personnel costs will start going down as your, your footprint goes down because it's very expensive having troops in combat with combat pay and everything else. Uh, that, that'll go down. Uh, we brought up Save the Benefit, TRICARE, six years ago or four years ago now. Uh, I think we ought to take a look at TRICARE again. I mean, uh, I'm retired now. I, I probably could pay a lot more for TRICARE than I'm paying now, and I probably should. We haven't raised it since 1993 or 94. I'd be careful with it. I don't want to hurt in, uh, young uh, sergeants and everybody else who uh, uh, we've got to graduate it. But I think there's some savings in TRICARE as well as best practices, as General Jumper talked about, about reducing the cost of health care. Get industry involved uh, to figure out how to use generic drugs and all kinds of other things uh, to be more efficient. But I think TRICARE is a place mm -hmm. we could go, uh, but to keep it, but to run it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't know, Gen Mr. Chairman, if I don't, General Blum, did you want to comment on that, General Blum? I, I don't think I have anything to add beyond that. I, 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 think, I think General Cody has identified some ideas worth exploring. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think in, in terms of looking at savings, it, it's not just a matter of of reducing the budget, but it's also looking at areas that we that we have to actually increase spending. Uh, the, the cyber warfare, uh, uh, the safety of our, our, our satellites, uh, and looking at you know the new sort of asymmetric weapons that that like the anti-ship ballistic missile that uh, China is coming up with. But but with that said, I, I do think that um, that there are opportunities in taking a look at our force structure and seeing what we can emphasize in the Guard and Reserve. Uh, I do think we need to look at uh, certain benefit issues, and I think you uh, mentioned uh, uh, retirement and TRICARE, and, and those things have to be um, looked at. Um, one question I have of you, um, um, and I've got to tell you, I, I think that our young men and women today, I think we have the most extraordinary uh, military in our history. Uh, I retired in 1994 from a combination of active duty and reserve time, but then came out of retirement 11 years later to go serve in Iraq in 2005, 2006. So I got to meet them, and I, and I just was amazed that when I look back at when I came in the military in 1972 to going back, just the night and day difference uh, of, our, of our forces. Um, so one, one question I have is that uh, retention rate is very high right now. I mean, and I think for, because of the professionalism that we have, I think people want to stay in the organization. Obviously, the economy is a factor, although I don't think it's the leading factor why people want to stay in. Um, we have a very elite military, and we, but we've retained the same kind of up and out structure of pretty rapid promotion system. Should we be slowing down that promotion system to allow more folks time and grade uh, to be able to um, benefit from their experience, from their training that we paid for? Anybody like to answer that? Turn it off. Excuse me. I think they've already done that. They've made that adjustment. Uh, clearly, the promotions to major, captain to major, uh, were expedited uh, only because we were growing the force. In the Marine Corps and in the Army, we were growing the force, and, uh, and there was more, uh, more slots. And so uh, the last... Uh, stuff I've seen, they've actually slowed it down back to what you remember back in this, the 80s. Uh, and I think, uh, but we also got to remember a captain who serves one year in combat 
uh, is probably got as much experience as a captain who had three years back not, do, not in combat. And so we balanced it very well. The best are still getting promoted, but we also grew the force. Uh, and I think uh, the promotions are, are, are going back to be settled to where they are. Okay. And I, I just want to make sure, I, I want to make sure that uh, I think any tweaks for the retirement system need to be looked very, very closely. And I do think that we can look at TRICARE, but I wouldn't mess with TRICARE for the active duty force. Okay. The, um, let me ask you, uh, we have, I think, uh, still have 107,000 between Europe and, and South Korea. I think it's 79,000 uh, uh, in um, Europe, and I think it's uh, 28,000 uh, in South Korea. Um, only four out of, I think, the 28 NATO allies are spending the minimum 2 percent that's required under the NATO charter. And I think two of them are probably doing it for the wrong purpose, <laughs> Greece and Turkey. And so uh, are they relying to, I mean, we can, can't we demonstrate um, our commitment to them by doing joint military operations as opposed to maintaining those forward bases? Uh, I think that's a very good op observation, sir. And, I, and when I was talking about uh, it's time probably to recalibrate uh, our participation uh, in certain alliances, that's, uh, that's probably uh, uh, the key one that needs to be uh, reconsidered. Uh, I don't know that uh, we need to have zero participation up front, uh, and I firmly believe that we need to keep our contact with our NATO allies close. Uh, but I also think that we, uh, uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, we take steps uh, to ensure they're, they're uh, pulling their fair share of the weight as well. Uh, clearly, that's fallen off uh, uh, over the years. Um, and in Asia, of course, uh, I think that this is the next uh, place that we really have to worry about. I'm not sure how much I would modify over there uh, based on uh, how, um, how volatile uh, the situation uh, well, My time's running out, but let me, uh, on South Korea, do you think that uh, at this point in time we ought to bring, bring in the families uh, for the 28,000 there at, at the $13 billion of construction cost? Uh, I, uh, it can always be reviewed. I think if you're going to put the all-volunteer force people over there, you have to pay attention to the families. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great morale uh, issue to, to separate the two. Uh, I think that that's the next area of danger we need to focus on, so I'm not sure how much I would modify the Asian scenario. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies to the witnesses and others. Um, with two big committees going at the same time, it's back and forth. I missed a lot of what you had to say, and I'm sorry about that. Um, the testimony that you gave at the outset indicated that we really need to start with a strategic vision of where we are in the world today and what we're likely to have in the future. I have found a most interesting dialogue or, or opportunity for a dialogue with a, uh, a document called the National Strategic Narrative produced by two members of the Armed Forces, uh, a Porter and a Mickleby, uh, that talks about how we need to view ourselves in the world of the future and that we no longer live in a bipolar world but rather one that is uh, multifaceted with uh, threats that can emerge very, very rapidly from totally unknown places. For example, the Internet. And suddenly Egypt isn't the Egypt of yesterday, but it's something quite different. Uh, in their context, in that context, they suggested that uh, we rethink how we use our military, uh, not as being the biggest, strongest uh, dog on the street, but rather a big, strong dog together with others, in other words, a collaborative world. I think we saw that uh, in the Libya situation, uh, not as robust a NATO as we might like. I, I, this, I think what I'd like to do is to introduce you gentlemen and the committee to that narrative and for us to think about that in the context of what we're going to have to go through, which is a reordering of um, the military. Uh, and what are the, the strategic strengths that we must preserve? You mentioned deterrence. Uh, do we need uh, 3,000 nuclear weapons, or can we get by with 300 nuclear weapons that are properly deployed uh, and safe, secure, and reliable? 
uh, those kinds of thinking, do we need to have a triad or is a dual mechanism necessary? Uh, do we need a fifth fleet, a sixth fleet or seventh fleet in the South China Sea? Or can we have a collaborative work with our partners? Those are the kind of things that I think we really need to look at now as we look at the reordering, uh, the repositioning, and the budget for the Defense Department. Um, so I think what I do is just, if you have seen that document, if you'd like to comment on it, I would appreciate it. If you haven't seen it, my staff will be here in a moment. I had those documents on my desk, and they carefully picked them up and took them away, but they'll be back. So if you've seen the document, please comment. Uh, yes, sir, I have seen the document. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but uh, it, it reminded me of a session I had with uh, um, the great, uh, the great uh, world diplomat Lee Kuan Yew, who's the guy who founded uh, Singapore and then ruled it for 35 years. And I was able to have a session with him at one time. And uh, he, he, he said to me, uh, America must, must never uh, lose sight of its role as the world's great benign superpower. And this document reminded me of, of his remarks. Uh, and I think that uh, as we reconsider our position in the world, this is, ha this is how we need to think of ourselves from a strategic point of view and decide exactly what that does mean. It means for sure being a force for stability in the world without being the world's policeman. Uh, it means uh, uh, rethinking uh, how we do posture ourselves. Uh, Unfortunately, some of our experience with our allies uh, has not been uh, what it should be as you uh, think about uh, sharing the load, et, et cetera, because uh, it becomes uh, obvious uh, very quickly to military people that uh, uh, the United States, States has the greatest capability, and it becomes uh, very comfortable to others to live under that umbrella. So uh, again, uh, but here I hearken again to let's look at the international affairs budget. And what we do to engage uh, with nations, again, as a force for stability in the world that indirectly, Mr. Chairman, does help uh, the military if we pay attention to our diplomatic efforts around the world to, to engage nations. These things should fit together in different ways and not really compete with each other when it comes to these uh, serious dis discussions of cuts. General? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I haven't read all of it, but uh, when I read it, I hearkened back to uh, the QDDR that State Department put out, uh, which basically said uh, we need to have a, a synergy between defense, diplomacy, and development. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, I, th I think we need to look at that as our, na uh, as our full national security strategy. And I think what Secretary Clinton and Bob Gates started uh, needs to be looked at. Uh, uh, I'll just wrap up in 10 seconds and say that it seems to me that this is the fundamental starting point for what we're trying, what we must accomplish in this year and probably the next year ahead of us, uh, that we take a look at this overarching uh, uh, way in which this nation acts. One thing that we haven't yet brought up is our own economic strength which is a major piece of this. And I know that in the discussions that we hear around here, we have to maintain the um, defense industry's ability to build things, and yes. But at the same time, we need to maintain our ability to make things in America. That is the overall uh, manufacturing base and intellectual research base of this nation. All those things come together, it seems to me, in a way that's going to be different in the future. And, and that's that discussion ought to take place as we figure out what the defense budget's going to be, uh, both the overall budget as well as the elements within it. Uh, and, uh, gentlemen, I would love to engage you in a long cup of coffee at some point uh, to discuss that with you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the extra one minute, 25 seconds. Thank you. Um, General Jumper, I think I cut you off. Uh, when you were you had some comment on uh, Mr. Uh, Bartlett's question for Mr. Lobiondo about uh, the Air National Guard fighter fleet transferring missions, I just like to uh, first of all comment, uh, as I did in my opening remarks, about uh, the uh, superb relationship that the Air Force and the Air National Guard have maintained 
uh, and how well the Air National Guard stepped up to uh, uh, significantly increase the pace of, uh, of duty in action uh, uh, during these, uh, these past 10 years. Uh, I sometimes wish that the enthusiasm that our Air National Guard shows for the flying missions uh, also extended to, uh, and the same question would have been asked about other missions, space, cyber, and the support functions, which are equally critical to our combat capability and which the Air National Guard uh, uh, is, uh, is also very capable of taking on. Command and control, I should add, add to that, too. In many cases, they do, I must say. They do. But uh, we always seem to get down to the flying missions when we're talking about, uh, uh, about comparisons and resources. Um, and in fact, I think even Steve would, uh, would admit that uh, uh, as uh, experienced, uh, as much as we enjoy the experience of the, of the Air National Guard and their pilots and especially their maint maintainers, uh, it is also uh, a core competency of our uh, United States Air Force uh, that we are able to uh, get ourselves off the ground anywhere in the world 72 hours to respond to whatever uh, does emerge in, a, uh, in, a, in, in a, uh, an era where we have to anticipate these growing short-term uh, surprises and be able to uh, deal with them and react to them. Uh, but uh, these are the issues that, uh, that have to be discussed, and balance is always the prime word. Uh, I don't let these, uh, when I was the chief, I did not let these discussions get out of hand or off balance, uh, tilted one way or the other in favor of one or the other. But I also insisted that uh, we have a healthy discussion about all the missions that the Air Force is responsible for and sharing all those in equal proportion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you have any further comment? I, I just would like to say it. In, in wrapping this up, that um, one thing we need to remember is we've already cut in the last year 465 billion going forward over the next 10 years. That's that's already done. The chiefs are trying to figure out how that will be implemented. They've given their recommendations to the secretary. He'll be up here for a uh, hearing next week, and we'll be able to talk some more about that. I think Ms. Davis had a question or a comment, something about uh, cuts should not be indiscriminatory. But if we get into the uh, uh, sequestration, that is just equal across the board. There will be no uh, chance to weigh and, and let those who have the most experience figure out how best to utilize those cuts. That's just already done and there will be no discretion there and and so I have problems with that in two ways the amount and the way it's done and I think that until we've really digested the 465 billion half of the cuts that we've done out of discretionary have come out of uh, out of the defense and I just everybody needs to understand that we're not saying that defense shouldn't be a part of this. It's been a heavy part. And uh, this is the purpose of these hearings, is to give us a chance to, to let experienced people tell us what these cuts are really going to mean when the rubber hits the road. So appreciate you taking the time and being with us today. And uh, we'll, there will be more of these type hearings as we move forward. And uh, one of the members mentioned he'd like to have a long cup of coffee with you. I, I think uh, I have felt that you're there whenever there's a request. So I, I think uh, other members, if they feel like they're not getting enough out of these hearings, I encourage them to give you a call and, and have some of these other discussions. There should be no limit on, on gathering information because these things are very, very important. With that, we'll end this uh, hearing. Thank you again very much for your service and for being here today. This committee is adjourned.